Welcome back to the Malt Miller YouTube channel, Home Brewers. In this video, we're starting a brand new series where we're taking things right back to basics to give all of you new all grain brewers out there or those looking for some inspiration on how to start crafting your own recipes, just how to go about it. James, I've done quite a few brews here with you all at TMM HQ. One thing I've never done is worked out how I craft my own recipe to for my own brew. Yeah. We obviously, we've got lots of recipes here. Uh, we've got recipes that our customers send in that I've, I've worked with, but I've never actually crafted my own, so where do I start? I think it's a fantastic thing to be looking at, Joe, because like you've said, we've got loads and loads yeah. of recipe kits on our website that either we've designed or yeah. that we've been given by customers or breweries that we work with. But actually taking a closer look at what goes into designing a recipe actually means that you've got endless opportunities as a home brewer, because once you understand the basics, and you've got a, fruit, a few of your own recipes under your belt, it really does open the door to that world of opportunity that's faced uh, for all home brewers. Yeah, I mean, it really is endless, isn't it? it if is, you look yeah. at all the different combinations that you can put together, the different styles that range across the world, it's immense. And I think that's a little bit daunting to someone like myself who's only ever worked with people's recipes. Yeah, well, look, I tell you what, before we jump into like how to start building a recipe, the thing that I always like to start with is, what's the beer that you want to drink? Because then you're suddenly going from, you know, many options yeah. down to maybe one or two, and yeah. it can hone your kind of senses. So yeah. uh, what's the sort of beer style that you'd love for us to try and brew? I was extraordinarily lucky to go out to Yakima for hop harvest a couple of years ago. So spent time on the west coast of America, in the hop fields, learning all about the hops, how they harvest them, how they produce them, the growing programs. And actually, West Coast IPA is a pretty nice beer to be to be brewing. Yeah. Um, it's drinkable year round. It's a bit stronger, you know, yeah, it's got it, tons of hop character. Yeah, the flavor in it is, is fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, I think I think West Coast IPA would be a good place to start. Nice. Actually, West Coast IPA is a beer style that many brewers want to start with, right? And there's a very good reason for that, some of which you've touched on there, but really West Coast IPAs and West Coast Pale Ales kick-started both the craft beer revolution and the home brewing yeah. revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a great place to start. Actually as well, with the changing um, sort of palettes that have yeah. crept in over the last few years, there's been some uh, advancements in how we craft a West Coast IPA recipe. So I think it's a fantastic one for us to look at, okay? Okay. Now to begin crafting a recipe, it's always good to look for some inspiration. Yeah. And we can derive that inspiration from a couple of areas. One, you can think about some of the beers that you know and love. But what I personally like to do is go down the other route, which is refer to the BJCP style guidelines. Right. Now, you can find those in the links down below. Um, there's also an app you can download for your phone so that you can refer to the style guidelines. But I've got them here on my iPhone. Very handy. And I've been having a look at American IPA, which is uh, style number 21A for anybody that's interested. Okay. And I've just picked out a couple of key things for us to reflect on. So with the um, aroma predominantly, because we're talking about loads of hops here. Yeah. We're going to want a prominent to intense hop aroma featuring one or more characteristics of American or New World hops, such as citrus, floral, pine, resinous, spice, tropical fruit, stone fruit, berry, or melon. Now, the other interesting thing that I've pulled out from the style guidelines is that you want to have a low to medium low, clean, grainy, multi aroma as well to be found in the background. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, many people, when they're thinking about crafting these style of recipes, they start with hops in mind. Actually, my approach to creating a West the Coast. Malt. Yeah, yeah. Yes, think about yeah. the malt first. Okay. Now, when the style was really becoming popular, there was lots of commercial examples and home brewers as well that were using some more traditional malts to derive that malt grainy character. And they were using quite a lot of crystal malt. Okay. Now, Flavours and palettes have changed since then, and yeah. also brewers' experience has changed. 
And most of the brewers now that are brewing West Coast IPAs are, and pale ales are using less and less and less of those crystal malts. Right, okay. okay. Why is that? Well, they can add too much in the way of sweetness okay. and create a beer that isn't quite as balanced as you would like. Yeah. What we're going to be doing, I think, is incorporating some other malts. So we'll have a, a, a strong base malt which I've got some ideas on, but we're going to be then using Munich malt instead of crystal malt. Right, so there's an element of sweetness in there? There is, but not as much yeah. as a crystal malt. Okay. And it's going to add grainy notes to the, the finished beer. Yeah. So the malt character will still be there, but it's not going to be dominant, okay? okay. But the base malt that I've actually decided that I think would be good for us to use is the uh, crisp, extra pale Maris Otter. Right, okay. And the reason I've selected that is it's going to complement that grain character that we still want in the beer, because mm -hmm. Maris Otter, being a heritage variety, has a good amount of flavour to it. But we've gone for the extra pale version because we don't want tons and tons of colour or too much in the way of flavour right. being added. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Joe, the other thing we need to consider then, now we've got an idea of the malts we want to use, is how strong do we want this beer to be? Okay. I, well, I think somewhere between 6 and 7% would be really nice. Okay. Like something that so we know we're, we're having a good beer. We're not having a, a middle of the week session beer. Yeah, this is weekend. This is a weekend beer yeah. that we want to really enjoy. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, That's... nice. Um, we can definitely do that. So now comes the bit that actually we're really excited about, which is when we're talking about hops. Yeah, we love the malt, but actually hops that that end hoppy flavour that we're going to get from the beer. Yeah, yeah and it's, in, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's evocative sorry. for this yeah. style, right? Yeah. You mentioned about, you know, um, going to Yakima, seeing some of the hops being grown there. We talked about how the classic kind of, you know, West Coast IPAs from 10, 12, 15 years ago are an influence yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. I've got three hops I'd like to suggest. Right. Okay. Okay. Is Centennial in it? Centennial is in there. Ah, yeah, nice. what a surprise. Like, yeah. Um, for me, I think actually, you know, we, we talk a lot about Citra, we talk yeah. a lot about some of the other hops that are kind of classic American hops, but for me, Centennial just is really, really good. Yeah. It adds lemon and lime notes as well as some piney woodiness as well, yeah. which I think would be really yeah. nice in this beer. The other two hops that I've chosen, again, are classic West Coast hops. So they're sea, they're sea hops. With all, all the right? seas, love yeah. it. <laughs> um, I've picked out Chinook, Chinook and Columbus. Oh, okay. Okay. So three very classic West Coast hops. And we're staying away from the, the well-trodden path. Of the right? citra. Yeah. 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 Now we need to talk about hopping schedule. So with a classic beer such as this, actually hops play a part throughout the entire process. You know, we, we're going to be adding some hops during the boil at different times to drive the bitterness that we want because right. this beer needs to be bitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It helps balance out um, some of the sweetness that's in the beer. It helps bring harmony to the overall experience and it leaves you wanting to drink more. Yes. Then we're going to be doing a big Whirlpool addition at the end and that Whirlpool addition is going to drive tons of aroma. So when we lift the glass up, we're going to get that big pop of hoppy aroma. Yeah and then we're going to be doing a dry hop as well. The last thing we have to choose is yeast. yeast. Now yeast is hugely important to the finished beer, but in this style, if we think about the yeast characteristics that we want, we actually want something that's really clean, okay? Yeah. And I had a bit of a thought based on some experiments that we've done recently, based actually on what you might be doing when you're watching this video, if you're new to brewing all grain, the way it tends to go is you kind of get into brewing, you'll get some brews under your belt, whether that's extract or all grain, then you'll start looking at ways to improve your beer. And the first thing we do often is look at temperature control for your fermentation. Yeah. Now, actually, there's some yeasts out there now that mean that that's less important. And the yeast that I've selected today is actually one that we've just done a video with, and it's the WHC High Voltage, okay? Yeah. Now, this is one of WHC's thermotolerant yeast strains. But the reason I've selected it is it means that if somebody's brewing at home and they want to create a really clean beer with no off flavors from the yeast, yeah. they can use You've this. got that from this one. Yeah, yeah, you can brew it in the middle of summer, put it in the fermenter, put it in the garage. Doesn't matter if the temperature goes up, it's going to perform really, really well and be a really simple yeast to produce this. So like I said, we're keeping it nice and simple. Yeah. We've got a fairly simple grist. Yep. 
we've got three hops that we're going to be using throughout the entire process yeah. and we're using a yeast that we can know and trust and not have to be too precious over how we control it yeah okay. all right that sounds sounds perfect i've got um our sheet from brew father that i've just been through and worked out i've got some idea now on volumes that we're going to need for yeah. grain so first and foremost we're going to be using 6.9 kilos of total grain okay shooting for an original gravity of 1062 right our yeast is going to ferment well yeah in our trials actually we've got nearly 80 percent attenuation with this yeast so we're going to finish at about 10 12 okay so we're going to leave a bit of body in the beer yeah a touch of sweetness yeah but not too much it's not going to be chlorine it's not going to be difficult to drink okay yeah okay and then overall hops we're going to be using 213 grams throughout the whole process of all three of the hops okay combined combined yeah yeah all right got it um and like i said we're going to add some uh throughout the boil three additions one mm -hmm. at 60 minutes one at 30 minutes one at 10 minutes yeah then we're going to do a hop stand which is going to be of 30 grams of each of those yeah. our whirlpool edition then we're going to do 30 grams each on the dry hop okay um probably a couple of days before we're ready to package the beer now there's a chance that this will ferment really, really quickly. I, I was going to say, how, how long do we think this is going to take? Yeah, well, with a, a traditional yeast strain, mm -hmm. actually, you'd be looking at maybe two weeks. Right. With this high voltage, we could get that done in a, a week. week. Yeah. OK. All, All right. right. Yeah, this is fine. And actually, from a relatively beginner's perspective, being able to have that drink, that beer ready to drink within a short amount of time. Yeah. It, it kind of cures that impatientness as to, I want to know what it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. I, want to, I want to taste it. Hey, we're and all, see what all we're guilty doing. of that, yeah. right? What we need to do now, get our gear set up, get our Let's grains brew. and get a brew on. Love it. We've set up our brewing equipment. James, what are we brewing on today? Well, Joe, I thought, again, in the vein of keeping it nice and simple and accessible, yeah. we've gone for a simple brew-in-the-bag style system. Nice. Okay, so we've got our 50-litre kettle here. Yeah. We've got it on an induction plate. Now it could be on a gas burner, it could be on stove your, top at yeah, home. Stove top yeah. at home. Mm -hmm. There's loads of different ways you could do it. You could have an element in the kettle, but this is just a really nice, simple way to brew. The one thing we've done differently is we've added a, one of our pumps. Okay. This means that we can recirculate our mash. And also when we come to doing the whirlpool after the boil, we can get some kind of vortex action going, going yeah, in there. Yeah, okay. All right? Yep, yeah, got you. Also, to keep it simple, we are going to be doing a no sparge brew today. Right. Okay. So that means we've got the entire volume of liquor, in water here. in here already. Right, okay. Okay. Now we're aiming for a 23 litre batch. To get to that 23 litres, we've got around about 30 litres of total water in here yeah. or liquor. And we're going to lose some throughout the process due to the boil off, yeah. due to the grain so absorbing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you want to whip the lid off? Ta -da. And we've been heating our water up, but what we need to do is we need to take a temperature reading of the water first. Yes. So pop the thermometer in, see what it says. Okay. 69.6 degrees. Excellent. Pretty bob on. Now, we're shooting for a mash temperature of 65 degrees. It's important at this point to talk about actually some of the calculations you have to do as a brewer. We're going to be adding grain into this that's colder yeah. than that. Yeah. So the temperature's going to come down. Now I've jumped onto our website because we've got a calculator on there, yeah. which gives us the ability to dial in the temperature that we need to have our water to, which is our strike temperature. Right, okay. And actually based on the temperature of the grain, we're actually aiming for a strike temperature of just under 70 degrees. So we're pretty, pretty much, much there. bang on, okay? okay? Yeah. Brewing the bag denotes that we're gonna have a bag in there, which is something you can do. Yeah. We're not though, are we? No, we're not. We. I'm going to use a basket. Yes. The reason for using a basket is that it just it actually... Makes it easier? We're gonna, yeah, yeah. Uh, partly makes it easier because we're going to be recirculating through the grain as well. It's a really fine mesh on the basket, so we won't get grain particles in the work. OK. And uh, the other benefit is that we don't need to crush any finer than our standard crush right, okay. on our malt. Yeah. So do you want to so pop, pop the... It in. Yeah. yeah. You guys are always talking about water profile. I can see that we've got water in here. Have you fettled with it or is this straight from the tap? Okay, so yeah, water profile and water chemistry is an important part of brewing. However, we're thinking about basics here. Yeah. We're not going to be jumping into like doing water, water treatments and adjusting the water profile. 
primarily because you can still produce excellent beer without doing that. Once you've got a few of these kind of brews under your belt and you feel like you're confident with the processes, you can then move on to that, okay? okay? And again, there's loads of tools out there. Brewfather's really good for that. It's what I've used to craft the recipe today. Okay. There's another section in there which can help you craft water profiles as well. One thing I will say to everybody though is the yep. one thing you have to do is get rid of chlorine in your water, okay? How do we do that? Well, with tap water, which was what we're using today, you can add sodium metabisulfate, Campton tablets basically in a powder form, okay. a small amount into the water, just bosh, gets rid of chlorine, right. okay. okay? Are we now ready to start brewing, please? Because I'm getting a little bit impatient here. <laughs> we are, we are, Joe, don't worry. I mean, okay. it, you know, there is so, something to be said for preparing, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Excellent, so do you want to grab our yes. first grain bag? If we start with a smaller one, have you got your mash paddle there as well? I have my mash paddle and my scissors. Cool. Already. Okay. Yeah. So Get that one open. What are we doing? We're we putting it all in. Uh, maybe do half of that bag to begin with. We'll and give it a little give stir. It a stir. Fantastic. Get the mash paddle in there. Give that a little bit of a stir. It smells amazing. Okay. Come on, Mapora. Here we go. I could do with being slightly taller. <laughs> Get yeah. the last bit in. Absolutely. I can see where all of that experience of <laughs> brewing with us is coming in, Joe. What? Excellent going in technique. Me, me being your stirrer, chief stirrer, yeah? Okay. Right, what we'll do now is we're gonna bring our pump into play for the first time, okay? okay. We have a nice bit of hose here, which we can fit onto the recirculation just on here. Yeah. Then, yeah, if you I'll hold that. I'll take control that, of that, shall I? Yep. Yeah, we need to prime our pump. So we're gonna open both the taps. So we get liquid flowing into the pump. Now we're gonna turn that one off, plug it in. Okay, so now we'll open the upper valve and we'll get some work flowing through. Right, so what, I'm, I'm covering it all over nicely just to make sure it's all submerged all nice and, wet. and wet and... Yeah, what we're also going to be doing here by doing this recirculation is making sure that the temperature stays reasonably uniform throughout our mash. Okay. So we'll just back off the flow rate now. Yeah. And what we can do at this point during the mash process is, because we're right at the beginning, just get in there with our mash paddle just to make sure that we've not not hit any other dough balls at all. Right, and our final thing before we start our mash timer is we need to take Check another temperature, temperature okay? Yeah. Because there might be a situation where we need to just bump the temperature up slightly. Okay, so yeah, we've jumped just under our mash temperature. So I'm gonna turn the element on beneath in the, uh, on the heater. That will very quickly bring our temperature back up. Right, okay, Joe, so we've just, uh, we've just been doing a little bit of recirculation with the um, element on, yeah. and we're now at our mash temperature. So I can turn off that. Yeah. Uh, you can take the, th the thermometer out. Nice. We're gonna pop the lid on. Okay. We're just gonna leave it now. Need leave to set it circulating. A... Yeah, yep. we okay. need to set a 60 minute timer, right. okay? Okay. James, we've finished the mash. Yeah. We've up to boiling point. Nearly. Nearly yep. up to boiling point. It looks pretty impressive. Where yep. are we? Well, you can see, Joe, on top of the work right now, we're just coming up to uh, the boil. Yeah. Okay, now that lovely cap of foam over the top, we call the hot break. And as you can see, we are literally just about to start boiling through that. It's at this point we need to add our first hop addition. Okay, right. so if you take glass number one, sorry, cup number cup one. Cup number one. Yeah, and pop those in. Yeah. That looks um, awesome. It really does, and it smells yeah. fantastic, yeah, it right? That, amazing. that um, Marisotta, the extra pale Marisotta and the Munich malt have worked together, and we've got that lovely work that we were looking for, which I'm confident will end up in a beer that's got just enough sweetness left in it, okay? okay a grainy yeah. character. Yeah. And you can see now we are breaking through the hot break. Yeah. 
we are at a boil. We so are. what we can do now is set our first timer. Now we've got to add another hop addition at uh, half an hour. So 30 minutes into the boil. Right, okay. So we, we need to set a 30 minute timer, all right? James, you have me working. So I've been measuring, yep. I've been hopping, yep. I've putting various other additions in, we've been cooling down, what's the next steps? Well, we are now at a point, Joe, where we can add our big old charge of aroma, aroma. hops, right? Which we're gonna do a whirlpool with. Yep. Now we've cooled our work down to 80 degrees. That means we're not gonna pick up any more bitterness okay. from the hops. We're not, not a huge amount. You will pick up some, but not, not a huge amount. Okay. Um, but I have to say the work's looking fantastic and smelling Smells wonderful. Amazing. Doesn't yeah. It? So do you want to get those three cups of hops in there? Uh, bang them straight in. Straight doesn't in. matter where. Yeah. One just get them all in. There we go. Uh, there we go. Expertly done. Wonderful. wonderful. Right. The next thing we need to do is get our pump recirculating our wort round the kettle because what that's going to do is really make sure that all of the hops are really nicely infused and we get all of the goodness out of them and the aroma. So we'll start by opening the bottom tap and then we'll just nudge the top tap open. Yep, here we go. There we go. So bubble, bubble. We are nice. now recirculating and well pooling. And we're going to set a half an hour timer and leave this to infuse for 30 minutes, right. okay? Okay. After that, we'll come back. Yeah. We're going to need to get our work cooled right down to pitching temperature. Then we can transfer it into our fermenter. Nice. So we've managed to get the work down to 20 degrees. We've had the pump running, so it's all been circulating. Talk me through what we've been doing and why. Right, so we have cooled the work right down to 20 degrees using our um, our work chiller, yeah. which was connected up to you know just some garden hoses running cold water through. And what we now need to do, yes, we've had the pump running to mm -hmm. get that, that hot matter really well circulated within all of the work. Now is a really important step. We put the lid on and we need to leave it, all right? We need to leave it for a good 30 minutes to allow that vortex to slow down, slow down. Yeah. and completely okay. stop. Okay, so it all drops down? Yeah, yeah. you've got it, and right? And then we don't get lumpy beer. No, we don't, we don't get lumpy Nobody beer. Nobody needs lumpy beer. No, no, I mean, undoubtedly we will get a bit of yeah. the protein come through, but doing it this way really minimizes okay. it, all right? Yeah. And then after 30 minutes, we transfer to our fermenter. Yes, now this isn't our box standard fermenter, James. No, 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 we're gonna be fermenting this in a firmzilla. Yeah. Um, only because we've got a lot of hops in here and what the firmzilla offers us is the ability to do low oxygen fermentation. Now, it's not a vital thing that for you, if this is like your first brew at home, to go down this route. There's loads of different fermentation vessels. You could just use one of our plastic buckets, um, you know, and ferment it just in a warm space in your house. But actually, the, these aren't so expensive that they're out of the realms of possibility. Yeah. But what it does offer you as a brewer is the ability to ferment under pressure, which has loads of advantages. We've got a playlist on fermenting under pressure, which I'll put up here for you if you're interested in that topic. But the primary reason we're doing this is because it means we can do low oxygen fermentation. We can transfer from the firmzilla yeah. after it's finished ferment into a keg under pressure. So further minimizing uh, okay. oxygen yeah. contact. Yeah. So it's just a really good way to preserve that really hoppy character that you wanted in your beer. Absolutely, which is what we're gonna get. Yeah, yeah. so once, uh, once we've had our 30 minute kind of stand yeah. to let everything settle, we'll transfer it into the fermenter and then we'll come back after fermentation, after we've pitched our yeast, after we've done our dry hop, and we'll be able to see exactly how your beer's turned out, Joe. Amazing, thank you very much. I've come into the office this morning and you claim you claim that the beer we brewed last week, the West Coast IPA, yeah. is ready. I'm not pulling your chain. Are you it, sure? I'm definitely not. <laughs> we are ready to try our beer. And yes, you're right, it's only been a week yeah. since we brewed. Now, that high voltage yeast strain from WHC has absolutely done its job. 
what I would say, me. yeah, what I would say <laughs> is actual fermentation was done in 48 hours. Wow. Yeah. So we were then able to move on to dry hopping. Yeah some cold crashing, and then we transferred it from the Firmzilla into a keg. keg. Now, keg. the reason we've transferred it into a keg is because we're big advocates of keeping beer as fresh as you can. Yeah. And for these styles, low oxygen transfer from a Firmzilla into a keg, you know, it really benefits the longevity of the beer. Yeah, less likely to get any sort of issues with, with the end result as yeah. well. Yeah it's, yeah, it's just safe, isn't it? It is. I mean, if you're new <clears throat> to brewing, there's no reason you can't bottle this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, transferring into a keg, means that we can try it really early. So oh, yeah, we, like know, a week early. Yeah, yeah we can, <laughs> yeah. you know, force carbonate it over a 24, 48-hour period um, rather than bottle conditioning and leaving it for a couple of weeks yeah. to allow that secondary fermentation. And but actually, you can then bottle, you can bottle from the keg if you want to bottle some to take to a party. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. There's, it's flexible. But I know you'll be itching to jump in and try the beer, yes. right? Um, but before we jump in to try the beer, yeah. I'd like to just ask you, how did you find um, the journey we went on building a recipe together and then brewing it? Very interesting. Um, the hops, I, you know I love my hops anyway. I mean, I love everything about beer, but I love my hops. The, the way that the hops were layered in in three different levels throughout the, the actual brew was fantastic. So we had the boil, we had the whirlpool, and then we had the dry hop. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that that was really clever, and I, I like that a lot. Yeah, and yeah. They, you know they all do different jobs. <clears throat> that, yeah. The same product does a different job in those three different stages. Mm. So yeah, really interesting to see how it will have turned out, and yeah. whether we've hit the goals that we wanted to well, achieve. We got that bitterness from yeah. from the actual the, the first hop hop addition, yeah. and then you know whether we've got that citrusy levels that come through. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to this one, and then malt. Yeah. Yeah, well, is it going to have a nice chitty head? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, it would be interesting to see and whether we've managed to maintain some nice sort of grainy notes in there. Yeah. Now, I need to just give you a little bit of a warning before we try the beer, <laughs> okay? Okay. So I've done a gravity reading yeah. and actually that yeast has attenuated very well. So the beer is actually a little bit stronger than we were aiming for. You wanted something sort of between six and seven percent, yeah, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're we're over seven percent. Much well, yeah, over? about seven point three. Okay, okay, it's not too bad. No. We said it was going to be a weekend beer, not midweek beer. It's definitely going to be a weekend beer. Weekend beer. Um, I'm not sure about a half ten on a Friday morning no, beer, but, but we'll see, right? I hope. <laughs> so I go and get us a glass. Yeah. Here we go then, boss. Thank you very glass much. Of beer for you. Yeah, half past ten on a Friday morning. Love it. Now, Joe, I know you're going to be eager to dive straight in and try the beer, but we need to pause. We need okay. to think about the goals that we set out at the beginning yeah. of the project and ask ourselves whether we've have hit we, the brief. Yeah, have we achieved what, what we wanted? Yeah. Now, okay. you, you mentioned a minute ago about the graininess, yeah. about whether the chip malt was giving us a nice head. So let's start by looking at the appearance of the beer. Yeah. Now, start off at the top of the glass. Yep. Yeah, we've got a, a nice head, nice rocky head on there. Yeah. So the chip malt's doing its thing. Lacing nicely to the side of the glass. Yeah. What little bit of glass there is to lace. <laughs> now, um, let's just talk a little bit about appearance. Yeah. This beer is only a week old. Yeah. We have added some finings to the beer. We added some brow sole. Mm -hmm. And obviously we added some clarity as well, which we'll yeah. come on to a little bit later. But it's not pin bright yet. No. So my expectation would be over the course of the next couple of weeks, yeah. this will brighten up. You can, probably, probably in the next few days, yeah, really. You can see through it already. Yeah. Um, so it, it just needs a little bit more time. So it's drinkable in a week, yeah. but not quite clear. Yeah. And as with everything, you know, beer benefits from a little bit of um, maturation after the fermentation process, just to allow things to kind of come together and be more harmonious. Yeah. Next thing we need to do, we need to go for aroma. Yeah. Can you remember what we were looking for? We were looking for citrusy. Yeah. A um, little bit piney. Yeah. Yeah. A um, little bit of malt character just underneath. That, all a of bit that. of sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a little bit almost drying of the mouth. Yes. So in places. we wanted a strong bitterness in the beer. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's give it a smell and yeah. just see how we're doing on on the aroma. Oh wow! It smells. Lovely. What are you getting aroma wise? You can definitely get the um, the citrus see and there is pine in there. Yeah. I can get the citrus and the pine out of it definitely. Slightly sort of lemon and lime 
citrus notes. Yeah. Which might be the centennial. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely getting some piney resinous character, yeah. which is characteristic of all of those kind of classic sea hops. Yeah, it's really quite pungent. It is. It is. It smells amazing. It's inviting, isn't it? Yeah. Can we drink? Yeah, let's go in for a drink. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a win. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Yeah, that's really nice. I can feel it on the roof of my mouth, that just a little bit drying. The, the citrus really comes through beautifully. And yeah. The... <laughs> You're proud, aren't you? Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I think I'm getting, um, definitely getting a strong bitterness, which is what mm. we were aiming for. We wanted high IBUs in this beer. Um, which we've definitely achieved because it helps sort of refresh your palate and make you want to go back and drink some more. There is a little bit of malt sweetness just before that bitterness kicks in as well, yeah. which I'm really enjoying. Yeah. And I think, you know, the Munich malt that we use on top of the Maris Otter is what's giving us that. But then sort of wrapped wow. all around those two things is this wonderful, piney, grapefruity, pithy, almost citrus mm. character. And I find it quite full of body, actually. Yeah, which is interesting because it's a beer that's attenuated quite well. So, yeah. you know, there's not much in the way of residual sugar left in there. No. But you're right, there is a, a, a good body to yeah, it. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. It really feels good like joke. you're drinking a, a good beer. I'll be really interested to see how this tastes in a week or two's time. Yeah, how it's cleared. Yeah, that will all depend on whether you have demolished the keg or not, but I think Rob will probably put a lock on the fridge so that I can't get near it, to be yeah. fair. Or he'll drink it. Or he'll drink yeah. it. Now, just before we wrap things up, Joe, we touched on a minute ago that we'd added clarity to the beer. And the reason we've done that is because, actually, Joe, you are gluten, gluten intolerant. intolerant. Yes, that's right. So it's a standard practice for us here to add clarity to all of the beers we brew so that yeah. you can enjoy them. And, Joe, you've, got, you've, you've been doing this now for a while and trying beers with clarity in. How do you feel about the use of clarity? I think it's fantastic. Um, not only does it help with the clearing, but it reduces the gluten down so far, it has no negative effects on me at all. So I can quite happily drink any of the beer that we brew without having any impact on me negatively, which is fantastic. So, you know, the whole myth of gluten-free beer is not made the same as normal beer yeah. is, is, is a myth. It's, it doesn't taste, change the taste, the flavour, the look, apart from the clearing or anything. So yeah, Joe, I think- you Good, know, good job. A, yeah. Amazing. First step into the process of building your own recipes. Yeah. You should be really proud of the work we've done. Thank you, coach. You've been amazing. No worries, pleasure, cheers. Pleasure working with you. Thank you. But I've got some homework for you now. Oh, here we go. Right? Yeah. We, need to, we need to climb back on the horse quickly, right? I can do that. Because actually for me, all grain brewing, like anything, practicing, Make perfect. learning, yep. you know, whether it's tweaking the, the first recipe that you've tried, making some adjustments or brewing something else yeah. is a really important part of the process. So your homework is to have a think about the next beer style you'd like to try and build a recipe for. Okay, All right? no problem. And I like the fact that we're going to go to something different, a new style, not tweak this, because yeah. actually this is this is pretty awesome, but uh, to to expand my repertoire for yeah. a new a new style. You wait in six months' time. You're going to be like master brewer. You'll have loads of different styles under your belt. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. No, it's been it's been a pleasure working with you on this one. If you've got any questions or comments for Joe or for myself on this video, please drop them down in the comments section below. We'd love to come back to you on it. Also, if you're not already, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell for notifications so you can stay up to date with everything we're doing here at Malt Miller HQ, yeah. and you'll be able to obviously get a notification for when we come back for Joe's second all grain recipe. Yeah. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, X, and TikTok, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers. Cheers.